I want to say thank you for letting me be away for a couple of weeks. It was wonderful. And I uh, miss you guys a little bit. <laughs> uh, Jeff, hey, Jeff, thank you so much for preaching. I hear you did a wonderful job. Yeah. Can be gone and allow people uh, and, and, and just to enter the service. You know, and, uh, yeah, I'm getting burned. You know, and uh, just to have people. Praise team and, and Brian led that Sunday before life. Brian, yeah, here to the <laughs> Last Sunday, y'all had a, a blessing to Eddie Blakely, a longtime friend of mine. And we uh, went to high school together, and, and uh, uh, he worked for me in uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico. He was my uh, associate pastor, minister of music and youth. What do you, you bless him last Sunday? Yeah, for all y'all there. So, so we all got a lot. I love you here. Shame on you. But, uh, yeah, there goes our missionaries that, that we are so fortunate. We'll hear a little bit more about it in our 40-day uh, prayer of our missionaries. And uh, we'll name them and kind of give you a little bit of what we're going to do. I'm glad to be here this morning. Yeah, we had a great men's retreat. Uh, we really did, didn't we, guys? It was a blast. And uh, Bobby didn't fall in the water this time, so that's a good thing. Like <laughs> I heard that story. He was getting fish and fell in the water. He did not cry out for Mary when he fell in the water. You want to cry out for my cell phone, my cell phone. <laughs> but we really, we really, we really had a good time doing it. Again. We just had some, we had some serious discussion. And uh, I'm not allowed to say what we were talking about or what I didn't want to. But we really had a, a tremendous, tremendous time. We're there in Matthew chapter 23. We'll get there eventually, but just. Uh, Kind of keep your uh, Bibles open there, Matthew chapter 23, if you would. I got a question for you this morning, and the question is simply this. How many of y'all go to Walmart? Okay. So we all? Okay, Walmart. I, I, I love Walmart because the people there. Have you ever on YouTube and you see the, the uh, pictures of people that go to Walmart? You know, you never know. How about, how about Ace people? Who goes to Ace? Okay. Now that's everybody in this room, right? Everybody in this place. Ace is the place of the helpful hardware and whatever. You have to that, you know. How about H-E-B? Okay. So here's my question. Most of y'all y'all go there. And here's my other question to that. Have you ever heard somebody uh, say with their own mouth that maybe in uh, outside of H-E-B or Ace or wherever we just mentioned in Walmart saying, you know what, I've never ever going back to H-E-B or Walmart or Ace anymore. And you ask them, well, why, why would you not want to go back there? What's wrong with that place? Well, they're just a bunch of hypocrites there. Have you ever heard that before? No. No. Yeah. All you golfers out there? Yeah. I've never heard that on the golf course. You know, so I'm not going to play golf anymore because there's a bunch of hypocrites. All you, all you ladies get your hair done, and nails done. But I'm not going to ever get my hair done or my nails done at that place anymore because all they do is just gossip and, and they're just hypocrites down at that place. I'm never going to go there. We never hear that, and yet we hear this a lot. I'm not going to go to church because there's a lot of hypocrites there, right? Is there kind of a contradiction here or not? That kind of. And yet we hear that a lot, that you know, I'm not going to participate in something, I'm not going to attend something, I'm not going to go to that organization because there's there's a bunch of hypocrites there, and so we, we would never stop going to those places, and yet we hear all the time, well, I'm not going to go to church because there's a place full of hypocrites. So we're going to look at that this morning. And so y'all are going to be kind of uncomfortable here, but you're going to get over it because all of us are kind of identified with being hypocrites. I like what Paul Harvey said one time. He was met with a, a guy that I used this actually. I didn't know it was Paul Harvey until this week. Uh, he met a guy that made that comment. And Paul Harvey uh, asked him, so we going to go to church. He said, well, there's just a bunch of hypocrites. And Paul Harvey, Harvey responded and said, well, just come join us because we always can have one more hypocrite there. And that's, that's the truth, isn't it? I didn't tell that to a man one time. And uh, you never take the church. <laughs> so I'm not going to use that anymore. I didn't work on that. I thought it would. I mean, we're just going to go that. But, but it doesn't do that. So let me give you a working definition from Webster's uh, dictionary from this. It's not up here yet. Is our screen working to it? Yeah. Okay, there we go. No, not yet. Turn it on. That's my big one. Here's the definition. Yes. 
so we've got to work with this. And I'm going to expound a little bit, and we're going to have fun with it a little bit more because we're really going to be uncomfortable with this sermon this morning. And uh, as Joe has already pointed out, he gets my notes, and he already responded back to me. He's not liking this, but Joe will pray for it. But anyway, here it is. Here's the definition. Hypocrite, a person who pretends to have beliefs or practices which they do not actually possess. Another way to understand that is that somebody that says something of who they are, but yet does something contrary to what they really believe and what they profess to me. That's a hypocrite. We all know the definition, don't we? We even work that in our lives sometimes, that definition. Here's another one that I kind of added to this. Someone who changes behavior depending upon the people or circumstances around them. Yeah, a lot of hints are not in there. Yeah, yeah well, well, we're not going to go there. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to say that things in my notes. Make sure they don't say that. Too. <laughs> it's kind of like the little boy that got caught. Uh, he found a garden snake. And his mom said, don't kill garden snakes. But he did anyway. He killed this garden snake. He, he found it and he, he took a stick and he beat that garden stick and he jumped on top of it and he, he jumped up and down until it was dead. And he killed it. He told his friend. He said, what did the snake? He said, well, I found that snake. I captured that snake. I jumped on it. And I stomped on it. And then I killed it. And then he went and told his mom, and his mom was having having uh, those people, uh, uh, some church ladies in there, and he went in there and he saw all these church ladies, and so responding to those that were there, he said, uh, Mom, you, i got to tell you, I, I saw a garden snake, and I stomped on it, and I hit it, and he looked at all these church people, and then he said, and then he went to be with the Lord. <laughs> So we, we do change the way we word things, we do change the way we behave things because of what? The people of circumstances around us. Let me give you a biblical uh, knowledge of, of that word. In the Bible, we're going to look at a lot of these verses here this morning about hypocrites. Hippocrates is the, uh, is the Greek word there. And actually, it uh, comes from uh, the ancient Greek theater. And the way that they would do that in, in ancient Greek theater, there were, weren't many actors or actresses, mostly actors, and, and what they would do many times, where this word came from, it would be the definition of one who wears a mask. In other words, an actor in those days would play many different characters. One actor would be many different characters. And the way that he would change these characters, thanks to, uh, where's my, I'm going to dominate this just while I go. So if, if I, if I, I'm uh, going to show you how to turn it. And so, so the way that these Greek actors would, would do, if, if there was a happy scene, they would hold up a mask. I know they didn't have the smiley face, I don't know that. But they would have a mask up, and, and they would portray that. So that actor would hold the mask up as he would talk, and if it was a, a, a humorous scene or a happy scene, they would hold this smiley face up, and then the actor would project that. And then and if there was a sad, he would flip it over or change mask, and he would do kind of a... Yeah, that's a sad face there. I'm not sure if that's mad or sad or whatever you get to do. And the actor would hold it up in, in ancient Greek theater. They'd hold it up and they would project that. Now, a good actor would actually take on that character. He would use his tone, he would use his language, he would use his demeanor to project whether it was sad or mean or angry or if it would be happy. You kind of understand that? And so that's where we, we get this Greek word was, was a fact. Somebody who hides behind a mask, and that's where exactly this word hypocrite comes from, that Jesus uses quite, really quite, quite a bit here. And so uh, that's where we even get the, uh, the uh, term two-faced. You ever heard that? Somebody's two-faced? Here he is, one. two-faced. So, so many of us may understand those people who are hypocrites are out here. The top message is uh, hypocrites, pretenders in a few. We're not going to look to the world this morning. We're going to look to inside the pews, inside the church, to understand where, where does this come from? And Jesus talks more about this, this problem than, than, than anything else. I know. And so, uh, I know tomorrow we're, we're having Halloween, and you're going to see all these kids with all these masks, and you'll see some adults. I know it's my grandkids. They're always, they have been patch Ninja Turtles. You know who those guys are? Yeah, Ninja Turtles. And immediately, when my when my grandsons put this these masks on, these little these little what do you call those things? Whatever, yeah, whatever. They're just you know these little things here. All of a sudden, they begin to do karate. They think they know karate because they're wearing those masks. And so often, when 
we put that on, you're going to see these tomorrow how this, how this plays out. This is where we get this word hypocrite. Portraying somebody you really are, and putting on to, to, to portray an image that really is not inside of you. That is what is a hypocrite, and that's why. Now, I mean, you all feel a little guilty. Don't raise your hands. But I mean, you kind of feel a little guilty here. Okay, maybe, maybe I have a little bit here, a little hypocrite in me, or I'm kind of that way, a little two faced in some areas. It's for the good of those people because if they really knew my heart, they'd really understand I'm mad at them. And so I just kind of put on this smile, I kind of fake everybody out. But deep down inside, you know, perhaps you're two faced. You're a hypocrite. I'm not trying to put any guilt on anybody because that's the job of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But it is something where where we, we, we have this. I heard this story one time. This lady was feeling really stressed as she was cooking this large meal for some, some church ladies. They were all coming to her house. And she knew these particular church ladies were very meticulous and, and very clean. So she cleaned her house. She just went through her house and cleaned everything. She was nervous and anxious. And her little six-year-old boy came in there and she just kind of pushed him aside. And she's muttering under her breath. And she's preparing this big, huge meal. And the ladies come over and, and they sit down and she's stressed out. And she turns to her little boy and, and she made the biggest mistake every parent should never make. She said, she said, uh, would you would you pray at the dinner table? That was the first mistake. I had a stressful time, and the little boy said, "Well, Mama, I, I, I don't know what to say. What should I say?" And all the ladies are looking at her, and she's trying to impress. She said, "Well, well, well son, just just say what I say." That's the second big mistake. And little Johnny bounced. Okay, Mama, I got this. He said, "Lord." Why did I invite all these people over to my house? <laughs> Sometimes, uh, we put the face on. And yeah, deep down, there's probably some problems and stress. And we have good intention here. So here's my question here. John, pull that up there. First question. I think we're just going to ask some questions here. Try to understand maybe about this thing called uh, being a hypocrite. And what that really means and how that plays out. So why does it seem there are so many hypocrites in the church? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? Yeah? Well, why, why, did the, why does the world say this excuse? There must be some justification in that, right? I mean, just look at my own life. There's got to be something there that would cause somebody else to look at my life and say, well, why does there seem to be so many hypocrites coming in the church? Well, the easy, easy answer is this. Not everyone in the church is a Christian. Kind of took the pressure off, didn't it? Well, hang on, we're going to go somewhere else in a minute and put the pressure right back on you. But just for a moment here, I mean, really, the, the easy answer was not all church people are really Christians. I mean, just because you come to church doesn't make you a Christian. You know that? You know that? If you've been here long enough, I've said that many, many times. You know, religion is never an excuse for a relationship, right? And so, so it's never an excuse for that. And so we understand that, that really going to church will not automatically change your behavior either. I mean, some of you are here, maybe because I'm happy. I come here every Sunday. That's where I'm supposed to be on Sunday morning, you know. A Sunday morning, my car stops up automatically, just kind of heads there with or without me. You know, it's just a matter of fact. <laughs> some of you come because social networking, you know. You kind of like the fellowship. I get that. And you get to talk to people and, and feel good about people. Some of you are really looking for truth. And you seek truth, so you come here. So there are many different reasons. But let me tell you, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just like you go when you go to your garage, doesn't make you a car, right? Kind of get that? That's a little silly. And so is the silliness comes that we think we come to church, we just automatically become a Christian because we come to church, right? And so that's just not true. So there's there's a lot of this dynamics of those that are believers in this in this fellowship that uh, that people say we come to church and they go, well, there's another hypocrite coming to church, and they're not a believer yet. So you know, I, I love Mexican food, I really do. But that doesn't make me Hispanic. You know, kind of get that? And so there's this there's this. Uh, Crisis identity, this character identity that we, we kind of have conflict here. Now, let me tell you this. Here's some good news for you. If you're here today and you're not a believer, guess what? You don't have to act that way. That's pretty good news, isn't it? I mean, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ in this room right now, you're not a believer. You've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Guess what? You don't have to act like a Christian because you're not. So that's kind of good that you're here this morning. You're seeking about what this really means. And it's a good place to be. You're in a safe place because. We're going to talk about what really is a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's contrary to being a hypocrite, by the way. And so if you're here today, I'm glad you're here. And if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, because I 
until you surrender your life and let Him change you, you'll never can you never can really make that full inward outward change. Amen. <laughs> Believers know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. All four of you. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I've lost salvation since I was here last. Okay. Second question is this then. So now we're going to get down to it. why does it appear that so many and we're talking about true Christians, so many really followers of Jesus Christ. Why does it appear that so many true Christians are hypocrites? That's a good question, isn't it? Yes. And the answer is? Yes. Here's what I think. I think there's a lot of confusion of what it really means to be a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, to be a real follower of Jesus Christ. And in that confusion, we, we interpret that as going to church or doing religious things. And the world embraces that as some sort of outward appearance, because sometimes that's all we can judge is outward appearance. And so there's a lot of confusion of what really is a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. And because of that, then, then because of that confusion of what it is, then it seems to be there's a lot of Christians that are hypocrites. So, so we're going to have to do this a little differently. And we're going to kind of back up here, and we're, we're going to understand here, the better that we understand what a real, true Christ follower, I think we'll understand what a hypocrite is. You kind of follow me? Okay, three of you said yes. Okay, so let me explain that a little bit more. So if, if bank tellers, a new bank teller, you know what they'll do? The way that they train a bank teller is, is that they don't look at the, uh, uh, counterfeit money what bank tellers do, how they're trained, they look at real money. They study real money. They feel real money. They, they bend it and they curl it up and they look at it and they hold it up. And they look at real money versus counterfeit so that when they look at the real thing, immediately they know a fake thing. Does that make sense now? So now that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at what it is to be really a follower of Jesus Christ so that we will understand what is false and what is counterfeit, what is two-faced, what is, what is these pretenders... Of, of, of cubicles. Okay. So the first thing, we're going to look at uh, some characteristics of real Christian that deals with past, present, and future. We're, kind of, we're going to bring this in together here. So, first of all, says, real Christians are forgiven sinners. And we're going to talk about the presence. Okay. Real Christians are forgiven sinners. The present. Sometimes it's hard to deal with the present. We always, you know, Paul, I'm, I'm working on a sermon right now. struggles with this. He says, you know, man, I, I just can't contend in what's going on right now. In fact, he, he just says, I'm really kind of screwed up right now. Paul says, uh, Apostle Paul, our hero, he says it. He says, man, I, in the meantime, but I'm going to press on. I'm going to forget the past. I'm going to press on. But in the meantime, I really struggle with the present. How I many of you have to identify that? I mean, you know, we, we know our past is our past is forgiven. And we know we got this hope for the future. And yet, in the meantime, how are we going to live this life out? Okay? Paul struggles with Today, but more than that, that's a huge. And so we're going to look at the presence here. I like the bumper sticker here, Josh. I'll have one. Y'all seen this bumper sticker up there, haven't you? Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. Have you all seen that one? Anybody got that bumper sticker on your car? No, you took it off last week when you got mad at somebody. Yeah, I don't know. Honk if you love Jesus, somebody's honking you. I like that one. I like that. Christians aren't perfect, but just forgiven. But you know, and, and by the way, the Bible never says that as a believer in following Jesus Christ, we're be perfect. You know that? Yeah. We're not called to be perfect. But here's what I would change if I was a bumper sticker writer. Here's what I'd change it to. Christians are perfect, just perfectly forgiven. Amen. And so really, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at we are believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are forgiven Sinners. Let's look at some scripture verses here. First John chapter 1 8 really talks about this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not what? It's not within us because we're lying to ourselves. So this, this hypocritical thing say, well, you know, that's really not me, that's somebody else. It's kind of like the Pharisee who came to sort of pray and he said, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not like all these other sinners in this room. It's kind of that mentality, that that uh, that hypocrisy, that two faced. Because we've all seen the false star of the glory of God. And so in the presence of our reality, to bring free of hypocrisy, we've got to understand in the present that we are forgiven sinners. And this verse clearly identifies us. If we say we're not sinners, then we're missing this. And we always must stay humble for the Lord that we are sinners.
forgiven by grace through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. Amen? That's how we operate in the presence. And that's what keeps us of the past behind us and keep us for the hope of His glory. But in the meantime, we realize that we are forgiven sinners and that's it. But that scripture verse goes on to kind of identify the hypocrisy versus somebody who is asking God forgiveness. And we've got to look at verse John 1 9. And this is if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that back to back scripture verse. Normally we quote John 1 9 because we like that. And by the way, that's just for believers too. But we must understand that, that if we say we have no sin, then we're lying to ourselves and we're a hypocrite. We're not true to what the Word of God says. Amen? You got that? Or stay with me. We're going to build in this thing so we get somewhere. And so the next verse says, but if we confess our sins, what? He is faithful to forgive us. So it's not about this mask of goodness that we wear around. As much as it is, we understand that we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and by His grace. And we walk in that that fullness of being forgiven and healed daily each day that we ask forgiveness. So if we confess our sin, what? He is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from what? All of our unrighteousness. And so this is how we live in the presence. We live in the presence of His forgiveness and not the goodness in what? You know, if you really think about this, we're the only organization that I know of in the world. The church. I won't just say the church is an organization just for argument's sake. But the church is the only organization in the world, ever in the history of mankind, that we come in this organization as broken people. That we, as an organization, we confess our brokenness, our weaknesses. You go and join a sorority or fraternity or a club, you've got to present yourself with your strength and your and your strong and how 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 they deserve you. You present yourself that way. But the church is the only place where we come as broken. And as we can trust that, the Bible says we are made strong in Him. Have y'all thought about that? that? That pyramid of the world is reversed in the church. For who is the least is what? The greatest in the kingdom of God. Who is humble before God, He will be what? Exalted. And the same thing in the church. We're the only organization that says, hey, we love broken people, don't we? We love people that just have, have, have messed up their lives and come to this place for healing. See, the church is not a hall for, you know, the saints, the perfect saints, but we're a hospital for broken sermon. That's really who we are. That's who we're called to be. And that's how God uses us. So let me kind of use this. I really, I've never used this illustration. I really want to use this illustration. I, 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 I marked through it four times before I thought, okay, I'll use it. But because it's, it's kind of revealing about me. I was at a conference uh, some years ago. In New Mexico, and uh, it was a church. It was a church conference for uh, lay leadership and also pastors. It was also a church conference for spiritual growth and awakening, which I was chairman of that committee. Somewhere at this in Gloria, I mean, I mean, I've been to Gloria. Isn't that a wonderful place? Yeah, it's deep in there. And, uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful place, and it's such a Baptist, and, and there's no alcohol. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> So I was there, and, and uh, uh, I was I was I was a speaker at that thing, and uh, and so we were we were there, and, and uh, these these guys were there, and they introduced me to some other pastors. I was kind of young; I was only about 32 years old, 31, 32, whatever. And I was there, and, and uh, kind of new. I've been there about two years, maybe. And so they introduced me and said, "This is Gary Fine, and and he's pastor of the fastest growing church in New Mexico." And I thought. Kind of. There are two other churches, First Baptist in Albuquerque and another church uh, in Albuquerque that was like mega churches, and, and they had to take more membership than we had. We were number three. We were a little, not a little church, you know, a thousand or so, whatever. But so, so we were like number three in the fastest growth, but, but when he said that, I didn't correct him. And so all of a sudden, here it comes. <laughs> Miss America <laughs> And people started just saying, there he is. <laughs> so for three days, I wore this mask. Yeah, three days. It's miserable. I mean, it felt good. I mean, here, a 32-year-old kid, you know, and you know, we get this recognition, and you know, I'm a speaker, and 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 I'm a speaker, and
and, and so I wore this mask. And finally I go, oh man, <laughs> they reckon he was coming. Now I wish I could just say inwardly, I go, Lord, and I put the then the pastors of First Baptist Albuquerque <laughs> showed up. I met them, and then the second guy that was a bigger church had more people than we did, and you know, joined and baptized and all that. So I was like number three, and so all of a sudden, you know, I did this for a while. And, you know, I got the spiritual face on, but I was, you know, finally, when the day came and we got this award for the church and all these things, and I just said, you know, I need to apologize. You know, we're really not. You know, the biggest, fastest growing church. You know, we've been recognized because we're a medium sized church and we did that. I'm thankful for this, but we're really we're not the biggest First Baptist Albuquerque and the other church, they're the biggest. Uh, and uh, and I did that. So now here's my question I hate telling that story. <laughs> Was I a hypocrite? Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. For three days I was. I wore this mask. Somebody was. Pretended to be somebody else. See, what happened was from hypocrite, I became the sinner because the Holy Spirit convicted me. And once the Holy Spirit convicted me, I had to deal with this. And so I had to convict I'm not that person. And so what happened, here's the point, listen to me, don't miss this. What breaks hypocrisy off a of follower of Jesus Christ is what? Confession and forgiveness. <laughs> That's what breaks it. Guys, I struggle with that because I sure love wearing that big Mr. Hotshot guy for three days. That wasn't me. But what happened broke that hypocrisy was asking the Lord to forgive me. And that's what it's going to do in your life too. We are forgiven sinners. In the present, that's how we are to respond. Let me show you a scripture verse here. I love this verse. First Timothy. The same source where the deserving will accept that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. In other words, in other words, Paul says, I, I am the worst. He didn't say I was the worst. He says I am the worst of worst. So Paul, our hero, says I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. That's how we move in the fullness and break in hypocrisy that we understand that there's a process in our life that's called forgiveness as we live our life. And that will do that every single time. I'll tell you what, we're really Christian church. It's not a perfect church. Amen? Amen? Yes. Uh, 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 a song of us are. <laughs> you know the one thing our man when we met, you know the one thing I asked him when we first started, I said, what, what drew you to the Christian church? And, and it was pretty unanimous. It was just the, the realness, being authentic. You know, for men to really open up like that, you know, you know it was being authentic, more than God being a priest. Being authentic. Lord, would you help us all to be authentic in this place? Amen? Let's be real. I'm not trying to fake anything. Let's just be real. Because the world is looking for that. We are forgiven failures, aren't we? <laughs> all right. Ooh, I got a long way to go. A short time to get there. It's happening gone for a while. Why is that? It takes three out of 27. Okay, here we go. So real Christians today, talking about this, are forgiven sinners. Number two. Real Christians are not what they used to be. We're going to talk about the past. We're going to talk about the present. We're going to talk about our, our past. Real Christians are not what they used to get. It used to be. Let's look at that scripture first. We know this one. Let's read this together. St. Corinthians 5, 17. You ready? Therefore, if we... surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Here's what happens here. You become brand spanking new. Isn't that good? Yeah. Old things are passed away and, and you are not who you used to be. Right? You're not who you used to be. And here's the question that I want to pursue this because we can really kind of preach this and kind of go out and say, yeah, I'm not. But let's, let's, kind, of, let's kind of make some application here. Another, uh, here's the question. A real Christian shouldn't be Shouldn't lose his temper, right? So let me ask that real slow for y'all. <laughs> a real, genuine, true follower of Jesus Christ shouldn't lose his temper, right? Okay, let me ask another one. I'm going to move on something else. That really did a nerve me. Don't get angry at me. I'll just read the question. A real true Christian shouldn't struggle with alcohol. Yeah, a real 
caught on that one. A real true Christian shouldn't swear. A real true Christian shouldn't lust. Right? Well, we're in trouble now, are we? Two different ones. Yeah, what? I know I'm going to step out of that as I get ready. Let's look at a little different. Young two? Young two? That's Texas. Young two? 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 Young Real Christians are becoming 
what they will do. We know one day, not, not, in, not in this life, but uh, every true follower will be perfect and uh, radically changed eternity when, when uh, God calls us home or He comes again. And then we see that radical change. But in the meantime, how do we, how do we evolve and avoid this being a hypocrite? Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Let's read that scripture verse 8. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will what? He's going to bring it to completion of the day of Jesus Christ. Talking about the day that he comes again. Isn't that a cool verse? He's going to finish what he started. Amen. He's going to finish it. And so you can either work with him or you can work against him. That's really the question. God's always at work in your heart. And he's doing this fruition of completing what he started in you when the day you came to him. His grace, his power, his mercy that enveloped your heart and changed you. Gave you a new mind, new heart, new spirit, new tongue, and, and a new attitude. He gave you all those things. And he's working in that to draw that out in you. And he's faithful to complete that which he started. And he's going to bring that into this future return. So God's not finished with me yet. We're still in this process, aren't we? How many of you all like the process? <laughs> Some of you not me. That's a question. That process is tough, isn't it? So, so if we're becoming more like Him, how, how does that process work? And what does that really involve here? Does that mean I have to go to church more and I have to read more and do all this more? How does that really work? I can do it on the outside, but on the inside, I still feel two faced come to church and I know that there's some things in my life that I feel like a hypocrite. Because the way I acted, the way I told them to chill, the way that I looked at that other person, the way that I got angry, mad at that person. And I come to church and I want to be dealt with it, but just not too severely. So how does this happen? How does that process, when we leave this building, what is this process going to be? And I'll tell you the process. You want to hear it? It's the Holy Spirit working in your life. Every day. He's the one that is a part of this process. I want to share some scripture verses that we give us this, this idea of understanding how, that, that, how the process is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? God is at work through this Holy Spirit. You understand that? God, we say real soft. God is at work through His Holy Spirit in your life. That is the process. Jesus says, I'm going to leave somebody here with you. This paraclete is the Greek word. One who stands alongside of. That's a, a good interpretation of the Holy Spirit. He is one who stands with us. He stands alongside of us, who, who watches on. He's always guiding us to be more like Jesus. He's always pointing us when we don't know how to pray for things. So what is it? The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us and we have no idea how to pray for things. It's the Holy Spirit in us. So, so we're to walk in the Spirit. We're to be filled with the Spirit. We're to be guided with the Spirit. And so He's guiding us and guarding us. And Jesus says, I'm going to leave you the perfect one who's going to stand with you and never leaves you. And so there's this process, and that's that process of how we can break the hypocrisy of our life is that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we're guided by Him. Let me give you just uh, four or five things. We're, we don't have time to really look at all the attributes of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So just let me read that. Uh, I don't know if we ain't got there. Whatever. Okay. One. The Holy Spirit prompts us to confess our sins. The Holy Spirit prompts us to confess our sins. That's why we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we don't know what's in our heart. Our heart is dark, isn't it? Yes? Our heart is dark, and sometimes it deceives us. In fact, that's what the Bible says. We don't know our heart. And so we must depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to convict us of our sin, to show us that darkness in our heart, because we think we're okay, right? I think I'm okay. And then the Holy Spirit comes in, and, and asks the Holy Spirit just to reveal those things, and all of a sudden, I, think, I didn't know that. And then I have to deal with that. See, when I wore that thing all, all day, I'm like, man, this is feeling pretty good. It felt good to me. It fed my flesh. It felt how people would go. There he is. There's Gary. Number one in the state of New Mexico. Yeah, it felt pretty good. I bought into that. You understand that? Until I got one with God. He goes, really? 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 Can I get that? And so, we need more spirit. Romans 8, 26 says the Holy Spirit shows us out of our weaknesses. And that's his God. Because I don't know. I think I'm strong. I think I got this. He just shows me no. Thank you. Okay. And I excuse that, by the way. I'll tell you one more thing. I said, well, I didn't say that about me. They said it. Really? I haven't heard that one in a while. You know what I'm saying? Second, he gives us the courage and humility to ask for. 
Jesus said this in uh, John chapter 16, uh, verse 8. He said, the Holy Spirit will come and he will convict the world of their sins. He also gives us courage to come to forgiveness. Jesus talks a lot about that, the Holy Spirit will come and he will stand alongside us, but he also said that he will convict men of their sins. And also he will draw them into that humility and the courage to confess that and ask for forgiveness. Third, he empowers us to live the way the Bible teaches. First John, uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 29, says something along this line, that you and the Holy Spirit will teach us all these things. You know that you cannot grow spiritually without the Holy Spirit. You can have information up here. You know what I mean? You go to seminary or cemetery, whichever your choice is. You can go to one of those two. You can go to one of those two and just say, man, I've got all this intellectual knowledge. But it never transforms into heart issues until the Holy Spirit nurtures it and places that into your life. You all know that? So that's how important the Holy Spirit is. He's the one that teaches us, instructs us. He shows us things that we have no idea they were there. Finally, he develops the character of Christ that produces spiritual fruit. You all know this from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It's the fruits of the Spirit. You all know those? I always get it backwards, but uh, you know, there's, there's a whole list of them. And then it says at the very end, I think Galatians, uh, I don't have that written down. You know, finally, it says, and therefore we're to walk in the Spirit. He talks about all these fruits and all these attributes of the Spirit of God. And then at the very end, it says, walk by the Spirit of the Lord so that you can produce these spiritual fruits. So, so the truth about that really is, and that's the last one is, is that the Holy Spirit is the one that develops a character of Christ that produces spiritual fruit. He's the only one that can produce that. You cannot manufacture spiritual fruit. You know that? You can look it for a little while, but eventually there's some worms in every spiritual fruit you produce because then you turn that into, well, I tried that long-suffering stuff. And it didn't work for me. You know what I'm saying? But the Holy Spirit does and nurtures that so that we're able to produce that and it lasts forever and ever and ever for those around us. So, here it is. Real Christ followers realize that forgiveness, we're, we're forgiven sinners. Second of all, we're not who we used to be. And thirdly, that we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what it really means. I've got another question for you. Let's go to that.
There's another Matthew, Matthew 6, 5, that when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue with the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they receive their reward. Yeah. People go, oh, did you pray for me? And they're, you know, they're on street corners making them to do that. Good job. And when you fast, do not look at me like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces. That their fasting may be seen by others. Do I say they have received their reward? Do you kind of get the idea here? They're getting shortchanged. <laughs> yeah. People are going, oh, and then and God's going, oh, you're going, you give credit. First take the law of your own life, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. A lot of judgment there. One of the number one complaints of churches, you know what it is? They're so judgmental. Right? Have you heard that? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not going to church. I'll just judge me the way I dress, the way I look. Yeah. Yeah. You have regrets? Well, Jesus was tough, buddy. <coughs> you mask wearers. You two faced. You know what he's saying? You liars. Yeah. You have regrets? Well, does I prophesy out to you? And you said, People honors me with their lips, with their heart. hearts are so far from me. Sound good? But their hearts are good. You got any more? Yeah. That's the next point. Matthew chapter 23, we're getting this, this is for relating this thing. <clears throat> Contains the harshest word Jesus describing professional religious pretenders in the few. I mean, he goes after them. We're going to look at it. <coughs> some, some, some numbers here, real quick. He sees more than <coughs> seven different times. He uses the word fool two times. Fool, by the way, is almost a cuss word, too. Yeah. Uh, blind guides five times, and serpents and brood of vipers one time. I don't think he was interviewing to be the pastor of the church there. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he just went after him. You see the seriousness of this? And Jesus addresses this in Matthew 23. This is in Matthew chapter 23 alone, you know, that he addresses all this. But let me tell you what the good news about Jesus is. He addresses this, and it's harsh. You see the words that he uses. We just look at all these words he uses. He's calling these people names. You give it, but you fool, you lie, you serpent, you brood of vipers, you snakes, you, you liars, you false pretenders, you pretenders in the pew. You're not who you are. That's some pretty harsh words, isn't it? But it gives hope. Jesus never, never, never condemned. That's what the Word of God says that. He did not come to the world to condemn the world, but he came to the world to what? To save the world. He's not condemning them. There's no condemnation there, but he gives hope in how we can break this spirit of hypocrisy. Let me give you two here. Y'all just gonna hang with me? Is that okay? Yes. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you by your hands and we'll, we'll continue. Okay. We did this. I just have I just have uh, one more. First of all, this avoid. Uh, here's, here's some cures here that we're going to look at. Okay, avoid uh, majoring on the minors and focus on the importance. Let's look at this. What I mean by that? Matthew chapter 23, verse 23 to 24. By the way, you small group leaders, the, the notes will be on the web page so you can look this up. We got a discussion on Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Woe to you! Let me stop right there. Woe to you! Is cursed be to you. In other words, Jesus is cursing them. That's what I said. Jesus is cursing them. Not saying cuss words, but he's cursing them. You know, almost damn unto you for doing this, what you're doing, that action. Not them, but the action. Can I say it one more time? Not them, but what? Say it with me. The action, okay? Because that's condemnation. You didn't do that. But he looks at that action and says, this is bad. And I curse that action. That's how serious he takes it. So when he says, whoa, not like, whoa, hold on here, Tony. Let's stop this little showcase. No. He's saying, damned under that action. Curse under that action. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. For you tied the mint and deal with you. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercies and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guys straining out the gnat and swallowing the camel. I love that humor there. I think about that. You know, we kind of read that. Yeah, I don't understand that. Next, you know, I'm going to get to the promises of God. 
So what these religious actors were obsessed with the trivial. In fact, they said, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tie this thing back. And if you want to look at this in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 10, it, it doesn't really talk about, you know, the tithing, the, 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 the spices and all that. But then, there, that was their debate. They'd sit around for hours, apparently, you know, the stories tell us. They'd sit around for hours and say, well, how much do, should we tithe the cumin? Well, you know, and, and should we tithe the, the mint? And, and, and they were just so minutely doing all these little things as religiosity and these things that made them look so good and having these deep theological discussion, discussions about should we tie this or should we not? I know I didn't really say that, but perhaps we would and we want to get this right and we don't want to make a mistake. And, and it's kind of like a church arguing about the color of the carpet. Who gives a rip about the color of carpet? The church is split every day because I don't like where they put the carpet. I want my color, so I'm just not going to go there. I just don't like it. Are you kidding me? No, that's true because you've been in those meetings. Some of y'all have been there. I just don't like how they put those plants on there. That's not the kind of plants I like. The deer are going to them anyway. <laughs> but that goes on every time. How right? silly Jesus goes, are you kidding me? Y'all are arguing about this thing and you're missing something much greater than I don't have the pews, I want chairs, and all, and all the time. It goes on and on and on and on. Jesus goes on to <laughs> I like this next one. You blind guys are straining out of that and slogging camel. You know what they were really saying? In fact, by the way, gnats were not even considered to be impure. You could swallow a gnat be okay and still be religious, you know, and are pure. And so they're straining out these gnats, you know, and they're so focused that not a dead bug, because, you know, you can't touch dead things. We'll talk about that in a minute. You can't touch dead things, so we're going to strain out the gnats so that we're, we're you know, we'll be, uh, you know, sacramonial pure. So we're going to out these gnats, and then Jesus says, you're so busy doing that that you swallow the largest land animal in Palestine during that time because you're just missing that. You're focusing on this minor, the little things, and you're missing out. That's what they missed out. They missed out on justice and mercy and faithfulness. Did you see that? They missed out on that. You know what? You know what those words are really saying? It's about relationship with others. You're so worried about being so, so, so holy, so pure that you're missing out on really what I asked you to do from the very beginning. And you're missing out on that verse that y'all all know about you Pharisees and you scribes and you lawyers of the Torah. You're missing out on that verse in Micah. Uh, Micah uh, chapter 6, 8. Is it okay? I don't know. No, I'm so good. You got my yeah. Yeah. Was it so old mere man. What does God require of you? But to what? Exactly what he said, pretty much. Is to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Don't forget about that. Relationship. You're so busy straining out gnats that a camel could walk in there and you just swallow it. wouldn't matter to you. Or you're so minutely, you know, doing those things that you never, ever sat with those people. You know what? The color of a carpet never brought anyone to Jesus. <laughs> whether you have pews or whether you have chairs in this place, never helped a broken person who came to those stores. They don't care about they care about their brokenness. Do y'all see that? They're giving them mercy and justice and faithfulness and forgiveness. That's what people are when they walk through those doors. Just like every one of you when you walk through these doors. You know? Apparently, there's a lot of new people here in this. And you've been here, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and each of us have walked in this place with broken. It's the only organization we accept people that are broken. We welcome people that are broken. You're our focus if you're broken. Another thing. I got one more page. Look, this one. Nothing on the back. Watch. Avoid the danger of externalizing. Go, go to the next one, Joe. I have that one too. Verse 25. 27, I'm sorry, Joe. Because he's not done. Jesus is done. I have to read it. 
What do you scribe to the Pharisees and Pharisees? For you will like about wash tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are filled full of dead people's bones and all of cleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others. But within, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Uh, I'm sure a little history was going on here. This was near the time of the, of the, of the feast of Passover. And uh, during the feast of Passover, the religious folks would go out, and what they would do, they would whitewash the tombstone. They, they were kind of sprucing up the city, but it was a little bit more than just sprucing up the city. And they would take these tombstones, and you know, because of age, and they'd, they'd kind of whitewash them, they would paint them white. It spruced up the city to make it very appealing, you know, and, and, but, but also it was for this. It was that, you remember in, in Leviticus 19, that we made reference to, it was also that, that if you touched something that was dead, a dead person, then you were unclean for seven days, okay? And so they took it to the extreme that they even said that if my shadow crossed over a tombstone that represented a dead person, I would be unclean. Even my shadow they did that. So not only did they beautify the city, but they also kind of white marked these things so they, they, they could avoid them so they would be pure. Jesus said, really? Really? That's who y'all are. You look good on the outside, but you are absolutely dead on the inside. And that was a slap to them, saying, you are dead bones because they're touching dead. That means they're impure. You know what that meant to them? Because they, they had all this aversion to avoid anything that was dead because they'd be unclean, especially as they're getting ready you know, for, for the feast of Passover here. And they're saying, no, 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 I my shadow can touch this. I want to be clean. And, and they worried so much about this that they missed out. And Jesus says, you know what? You're just like they are. You look good on the outside, but you were the evidence. So Jesus is saying like, they avoided on the outside that rendered them impure. They were internally unclean. And the inside. And like an actor, two-faced, when they put their mask on, they, they look so good to the rest of the world. But Jesus said, you are absolutely so here's my final thought. Fellow hypocrites. And so can we focus on really what's important? Mercy and justice and faithfulness. And focus on what God has done in our hearts and our minds and our spirits so that we can live this thing out. Here's my final thought. I just want to read this. Even though Jesus was extremely harsh on the hypocrites, he never ever he gives us a hope and a cure. Tell us up there, Joe. Let's just this out. The hope of hypocrisy is not, we give you a couple of times here, it's not changing the outside. You can't do it, can you? You think you can. You look good on the outside, but there's still what? Deadness in the inside. So the hope for hypocrisy is not to change the outside, nor is it it's still all about their job. Do more religious stuff. Aren't you glad about that? No? I'm just going to do more religious stuff. Look at it. You're going to think I am. Stand before God. He goes, really? So what's the answer? Here it is. But the hope is in the change that takes place on the inside. Do you understand that? See, because what happens on the inside, we, we can't change the inside. Only God through the Holy Spirit can change us on the inside. You can do all the things and it looks good and Get candy out to kids and do Bible studies and lead Bible studies and preach a sermon and still be on the inside, unchanged. So see, this is our hope here. Everyone in the see what the Lord said, He's going to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We from all cleanse us. It's that internal cleansing. It's not outwardly, but it's an internal word. It's an internal cleansing as we confess our sins unto Him. And that's our hope. Every one of us, do we have hope here today? You have hope to break hypocrisy off your life. It must start with the inside, not the outside. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Let me give you the cure of that. Here's the cure. The cure of hypocrisy is not spend the rest of your life trying to cover it up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, I just want people to like it. I just want people to know that. That takes more work covering up stuff than it does being real. Do you know that? And can we can we 
we make a promise today that, that we're not going to get offended when somebody really uncovers themselves up to us? Just to say, man, I, last week I really blew this. I went, can we not embrace them and think about how they've changed and how we can help them change and be an example? So spend the rest of your life trying to cover it. That's not the way we do that. So what's the cure? Here it is. But the cure is to ask Christ to forgive you and to change you. That's the cure. He is the cure for any disease, any sickness that we have. And then he will cover your sins. Isn't that cool? You see, we can spend all our life trying to cover it up and trying to cover it up and trying to fake people out and trying to wear this mask and say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Praise the Lord, I'm good, I'm good. And you have to get inside. But the Lord says, listen, if you come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and try to cover up, I will give you rest in me. So can we just kind of lay this mask down and just kind of say, you know, kind of done with this. I'm just going to be real, I'm going to be authentic. I want to be genuine in my life, and I start with what? We know that, Lord, you have to change us from the inside to the outside. Second of all, that that change will only come until we ask Christ into our heart, the Holy Spirit to guide us, and He covers our sins, and we don't have to deal with it anymore. Amen? Amen. I'm done. Amen. Right, I'm done. <laughs> we'll come again to Goodness, Lord, you're, you're, uh, you're so patient with us. Your mercy endures forever and ever. I'm amazed that you just put up with us. I love us so much. God, I thank you for your, your graciousness here today. Lord, that you don't bring anyone into condemnation, but you're bringing people into resolvement of who you are and who we are. That we could be genuine and authentic and real. Lord, that, that the people, when they come into this building, they won't see a house full of hypocrites, but they'll see a house full of sinners that are receiving your grace and your forgiveness and your mercy. Lord, may we individually be authentic and real and true to who we are through Christ. But also as a church, may we, we be real, that people are looking for a place that they can come to feel accepted not judged to know that we will love them no matter what because we've been down that road before so Lord we break off any spirit of hypocrisy in this fellowship by the blood of Jesus Christ who forgives us, who cleanses us of our past of our present, of our future and so Lord in the meantime we ask the Holy Spirit just to fill us so that we can we can really deal with this and then be honest about hypocrisy and, and our hearts deceives us. And so today we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts every area to cleanse us thoroughly and to wash us white as snow. Forgive us when we've been two faced. Forgive us when we've been a hypocrite. When we've said one thing with our lives. Vindication before we really believe. But today, Lord, you said it's a new beginning. So, Lord, we welcome that. We welcome that new beginning of taking off our mouths, being authentic, and living for the kingdom of God forever and ever. Lord, we love you today. It's been good to be in this place. We bless the name of the Lord. He is our salvation, our rock, and our fortress. And we exalt him and worship him. Thank you, Jesus, that you made all this possible. And thank you that you're continuing doing that work, that which you started in our hearts. For that we ask in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. We have communion. If uh, you're a believer, we invite you to participate.